a new government, Kamal, a new era and a momentous day. And it was sunshine and rain, which just about sums up Labour and the Conservatives. <laughs> well, Kamala, we've been up for just about forever. We're going to tell you all about the latest on our new Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer, the Conservative meltdown and the Farage surge. Welcome to this special new government edition of The Daily Tea with me, Camilla Tomini. And me, Kamal Ahmed. Well, Camilla, what a 36 hours we've had. We've been awake for all of it. Um, yes. We're coming to um, the finals home straight before bed, possibly. But uh, we want to really sum up for our brilliant audiences what has happened over these uh, momentous hours. I think there are four big blocks we want to talk about. There's the new PM, of course. There's the old PM, uh, rather sad. And the challenges ahead for the government and the new parliament. And then, Camilla... A very special, surprising guest. Who we didn't necessarily think would have anything to celebrate today. But Sir Ian Duncan Smith, former party leader of the Conservatives, is in the Daily Tea studio celebrating the fact that somehow he pulled off a minor miracle in Chingford and Woodford Green and is still the serving Tory MP there. I think maybe the last Conservative left in Greater London, actually. Just Kamal. about, to be honest. So, And a favourite of the Daily Tea. So it's lovely to have Ian Duncan Smith joining us a little later. Wait around for that. But Camilla, you have just... You just came in saying, oh, I feel a bit hot. I'm you a bit sweaty. You I still are a bit hot. No, but it was raining when we arrived and it's then... So, it's and so difficult to dress for 36 hours on the trot. And also, Kamal, knitwear... In summer, we've Line discussed hits. this. That's yeah. for another podcast. Um, I mean, You've I, hot footed it back. From I hot footed it back. We really rushed because we wanted to be here to record this on time. And my observations well, first of all, it was astonishing that the rain literally stopped before his car pulled up in some kind of positive omen in comparison to his predecessor who was <laughs> rained on really from start to finish. Things can only get wetter and now suddenly sunnier. You see, Keir Starmer has already had an effect. Bringing sunshine. <laughs> and uh, crowds gathered in Downing Street, lots of flag waving. I spotted Sue Gray, who is uh, Keir Starmer's chief of staff, former inquisitor of Boris Johnson during the Partygate scandal. That was quite interesting. Um, and it was actually quite nice to see... Uh, I was going to say Mr and Mrs Starmer, that's not right. Sakia and Lady Victoria together, we don't often see that. She looked beautiful in a red dress, which I believe was by Victoria Beckham. She was wearing the most astonishing silver shoes, which did catch my eye. And um, they both just looked overjoyed with the outcome. And I, I stood in Downing Street and th thought to myself, this, absolute, this day of days sums up the brutality of politics. You know, one out. Pack your bags, you're off, it's resignation terrible, speech, and gone. And then the next minute, a new incumbent, different people waving flag. You know, the, the, the battles of the election campaign left behind. You can't not be excited in the newsroom here. Um, everyone sort of stood up, came into the centre where the news desk is, watching the big screens. I thought two things when I was watching it. A little whiff of Tony Blair in 1997. I think he was the last Prime Minister to do this march up Downing Street, shaking hands with everyone, uh, people waving flags, particularly the Union flag, I thought was quite striking. Keir Starmer has made sure there's been plenty of evidence of his patriotism. And the second thing was the message, which I know you're going to get onto because you were actually down there, which is what's so wonderful. But Ronald Reagan, morning again in America, this idea that the best times are ahead of us. After so much doom and gloom and problems that this country has faced, he really tried to set a new tone. So Blair and Reagan, possibly a whiff of that. That public service is a privilege and that your government should treat every single person in this country with respect. We will carry the responsibility of your trust as we rebuild our country. But whether you voted Labour or not, in fact, especially if you did not, I say to you directly, my government will serve you. Politics can be a force for good. We will show that. We've changed the Labour Party, returned it to service, and that is how we will govern. Country first, party second. Changing a country is not like flicking a switch. The world is now a more volatile place. This will take a while. But have no doubt that the work of change begins immediately. So basically, 
we had to muscle our way to the front because we were jolly come lately's because we only decided I'd go down there at the last minute. That's news, people. That's how it happens. And basically, there was this guy there with this massive jib camera, which he was revolving around to get aerial shots of the whole of Downing Street. And that meant that he had to kind of revolve it. And we were slightly standing in the way and he didn't look happy about it. And then he sort of said, oh, you know, have you got any bribes? And I said, well, I've got a packet of mini cheddars. His eyes lit up. And he let us stand in this prime position where I had a perfect view of number 10 and I did repay him with those cheesy snacks and he was delighted. So there was a little bit of a quid pro quo going on. All of the assembled press, normally it's quite sharp-elbowed, Kamal, but I, I like the convivial ad- atmosphere. Is that a reflection of the new government? I think there's a new generosity abroad, obviously. <laughs> it's working even for you, Camilla, and the jib operator. That's absolutely lovely news. Let's hear from you in Downing Street. The theme was extremely earnest. He talked about how his victory had been decisive, that he had a clear mandate, talked about putting together a government of service, said for far too long there's been too much of a gap between politics and the public, that it had spirited away feelings of hope and belief in a better future. He said that service was a privilege and that people deserve to be treated with respect. He also made a direct appeal to those people who didn't vote for a Labour government, conscious perhaps of the lower vote share for Labour this time round than in 2019, 2017. He said he wanted to change a situation where people were turning a blind eye to those in insecurity, wanted to get the NHS back on its feet, control our borders, build more affordable homes, give security, he said, to working class families like mine. A very emotive speech, I think a speech grounded in his socialist beliefs, a speech in which he wanted to end the era of noisy performance, a reference, I think, not just to Nigel Farage, but also to Boris Johnson. Um, And in he goes now, after he and his wife have just finished hugging some of the well-wishers. They're on their way in now, hand in hand. The new Prime Minister and his First Lady We know that when they go inside, they'll be greeted by more well-wishers and indeed the Downing Street staff. Posing on the front steps for the obligatory photographs. And then after they did their smiles and waves, an arm around Lady Victoria there. We don't often see them together, so good to see them engaging a little public display of affection. nodding there, smiling, looking very relaxed and happy, waving to all of the assembled photographers who are here in front of me on risers. So some are high, some are low, they're all crammed in like sardines. And there's a little nod there, a nod of thanks. And then he's just ushering his wife, Lady Victoria, to go into Downing Street first. And off they go to their new life, an extraordinary chapter begins, not just for Mr and Mrs Starmer, I should say, Sir Keir and Lady Victoria, but also for Great Britain. Camilla, almost sounding Blairite there, Camilla. I know it's a little, little, bit of, little bit sick in your throat, I'm sure. But anyway, um, <laughs> let's go on to, as you say, the brutality that obviously only an hour or two earlier than that, Rishi Sunak left his old house of number 10 rather gracious resignation. And let's keep that tone of generosity. Let's hear from the former Prime Minister. Whilst he has been my political opponent, Sir Keir Starmer will shortly become our Prime Minister. In this job, his successes will be all our successes. And I wish him and his family well. Whatever our disagreements in this campaign, he is a decent, public-spirited man who I respect. He and his family deserve the very best of our understanding as they make the huge transition to their new lives behind this door and as he grapples with this most demanding of jobs in an increasingly unstable world. It was actually quite a strong speech, wasn't it? And somebody in the newsroom who shall remain nameless said, oh, he could be prime minister in a, in a, in a quite ironic fashion. So, you know, he saved the best till last and off he goes. To be fair, Kamal, people thought that he would be heading straight off to California and he has said that he will stick around and still serve as an MP. So let's he, see. he has said five years. And I think what we have discovered over these last six weeks, he's a pretty decent bloke. So let's see if he does the full five years. 
And of course, just as quickly as the election campaign is over, it's all now about the new government. It's all about looking forward, whatever the trials and tribulations of the last uh, six weeks. I think there are sort of four or five major areas. Let's look at there'll be the economy, yes. tax and spend, growth. That's what they've said. They are going to prov- They are not going to tax people. They are going to spend more, and they're going to discover growth. That's three pretty big challenges for the next period. Migration. They're abandoning the Rwanda scheme. How will they stop the boats? Uh, will these return deals ever work? And will immigration truly come down to numbers that the public feel are justifiable? The NHS and social care. Um, big area for West Streeting. We're expecting him to be the new health secretary. And then finally, and this is really going to be rapidly approaching the new prime minister, the NATO summit. He'll be flying off to America next week for the 75th anniversary of the uh, NATO alliance, uh, meeting all the leaders there, of course, including uh, Joe Biden. They'll be discussing uh, security in Europe, Ukraine, the Russian invasion, and of course, uh, the Middle East, which is played quite a loud role in this election, given that there are now five independent pro-Palestinian MPs, where Labour struggled and lost some actually pretty big figures. John Ashworth, uh, Thangnam Debonair, both lost um, in seats contested by pro-Palestinian candidates. So all those issues are immediately in the intra. It is remarkable, isn't it, Camilla? how quickly you move from opposition into running one of the most powerful, whatever you think of our status around the world, still one of the most powerful nations in the world. And he seemed as if he was in a hurry. Change begins immediately, he said in that speech, so he won't be resting on his laurels. The other interesting thing about change, Kamal, I mean, we're used to a certain parliament with familiar faces in it. As we went through the night and the seats fell, it's like, oh my goodness me, you know, we've lost Johnny Mercer, we've lost Penny Mordaunt, we've lost... Lucy Fraser, the names kept on rolling. But of course, he's in a parliament now with an interesting rabble of different characters, isn't he? Was he trying to make a point about serious politics of service and then have a kind of thinly veiled dig at Nigel Farage, do you think? Yeah, I think talking about respect, I think... I think genuinely Labour do need to attempt, whether they'll be successful is a different matter, do need to attempt to change the political conversation. I think a lot of voters are exhausted by the arguments, whether it comes from Labour or it comes from the Conservatives or it comes because of reform or it comes because of the harder left. For whatever reason, the public would like a period of quiet, to be frank, an actual doing, not shouting about it. Period a, of quiet with Nigel Farage well, in the House of let's Commons. Go, let's go through the shape of the new parliament. Labour's majority, although incredible at 174, uh, Keir Starmer would not have imagined when he took over the leadership of the Labour Party in 2020 that he would have got anywhere near that in such short order. But nevertheless, still a majority lower than Tony Blair's in 97 and lower than Tony Blair's in 2001. So not the wipeout moment um, that was expected or predicted by some polls. But let's go through those new groups and, and how the other parties did. I think Nigel Farage, Camilla, when we were looking at the exit poll, the first thing that jumped out was this idea there could be 13 reform seats. That didn't quite happen. But Farage has had a good night and He's a had good a great day. Night. I mean, he had been bragging, I think, on GB News last week about winning six million votes. OK, not quite there, four million. But coming second in nearly 100 constituencies. I mean, I felt that that was the pattern of the beginning of the night as some of the red wall seats switched. The presence of reform pushing the Conservatives into third place was plain for all to see. Actually, I think four seats, that's a start. That's the bridgehead that he wanted to build in order to kind of, I don't know, create some kind of stepping stone to being Prime Minister in 2029. Kamal, I still can't quite work out how he does that because I think we've got the reform vote share now on about 17%. That number, as you and I both know, needs to begin with a three. It's problematic, by the way, that Labour's vote share begins with a three and we might get onto that in a moment. So Nigel Farage already celebrating the fact that he's going to have a pint with Lee Anderson in Strangers uh, when Parliament reopens, which will obviously be somebody who will be making noise on the sidelines. But let's talk about Ed Davey. We said this, Kamal, didn't we? We We said we would be waking up 
on July the 5th. Actually, we haven't gone to bed, so we haven't woken up yet. <laughs> and we look forward to doing that at some point tomorrow. But we said we'd be waking up with Ed Davey, 71 seats for yep. the Lib Dems. That's the most successful for the Liberal Democrats in their more modern guys and makes them a truly significant player it gives them a much uh, bigger role in parliament it means that they will get um the final two questions for prime ministers uh, in prime ministers questions which gives them much more uh, of a platform to use and i think the relationship or the non-relationship between reform and between the liberal democrats will be one of the defining characteristics The journey that Nigel Farage would like to take towards being a leader of the right uh, is is hampered by the fact that the biggest party that is not the Conservatives that is in opposition is the Liberal Democrats. Mm. And Ed Davey, although they got fewer votes than reform, have got that concentration where first past the post works for them. I think Sir Ed Davey uh, has played a very clever campaign and the Liberal Democrats, majoring on social care and sewage. And stunts. And stunts. Big issues, not the stunts so much, but those two issues, uh, social care and sewage, big issues across the swathes of uh, South East and South West England where the Liberal Democrats did best. How he will play uh, a role with Labour, I think, will be very, very interesting. It does build the risk, which is shared by, I think, lots of our readers, many of our colleagues and our columnists, that there is even more of a built-in, what might be described as liberal, left, we both don't, we both hate this word, but let's use it, progressive Mm. coalition within the government. Will Davey really be able to stand up to... uh, Keir Starmer when he starts going on a journey on different issues. I, I think sort the of answer is no. Yeah, yeah, I don't have much faith in that. Um, we should mention the Greens. The Greens. Up. I mean, they've gone from one seat to four. Their vote share went up by four percent. In a way, I find it quite remarkable that leafy Middle Englanders in Waveney and Herefordshire have opted for a party whose manifesto includes taxing people more, banning short-haul flights, um, encouraging natural births over caesareans, which I'm not sure is completely aligned with modern women's thinking. I mean, it's a pretty extremist platform, but then you've got people living in rural areas who quite like what they were saying about self-sufficiency and your point about cleaning up the rivers and getting plastics out of the seas and all the rest of it. But I do think (laughs) slight... Uh, lack of kind of cogent thinking there in some of those middle class people voting to make I think themselves it shows poorer. The weakness. Yeah, I think it shows the weakness of Labour's offer that people were keen in many seats to either vote Liberal Democrat or Greens because they can't stomach that move to Labour, which is always, as we've discussed, been a weakness for uh, Keir Starmer. Let's just go on to um, what might be described as the nationalist vote. So let's start with Scotland. An appalling night mm. for the SNP. Actually, I think probably being punished as much for the controversies that have stalked, obviously, Nicola Sturgeon um, uh, when she resigned as leader, but also because they have been in power for so many years and public services, similar to in Wales, where they haven't, Labour hasn't been as badly affected as the SNP has been in Scotland, but similar that the performance of the public sector in Scotland has simply not been good enough. Yeah, also that just change. We want change. Um, They've been in power for too long. Interestingly, there were lots of saltires being waved in Downing Street. So Labour having recaptured Scotland is a key theme, clearly, of this election. Also, it's politically convenient for Keir Starmer to say that he's helped keep the union together, not least when the opposition is called the Conservative and Unionist Party. Although when I asked a couple of former ministers about that, said that actually, you know, that was one silver lining on a very dark cloud, this idea of the evisceration of the SNP, who are no friends of the Tories, let's be honest. Absolutely not. And then just... Just briefly, I think it's worth mentioning, we may come back to this um, in future Daily Tea episodes, but what's going on in Northern Ireland, I think, is interesting. It was always said that possibly one of the results of Brexit and this relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic and Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK was that 
possibly the nationalist instincts in Northern Ireland would become stronger. And there seems to be some evidence of that. Mary Lou MacDonald, who's the leader of uh, Sinn Féin, they've had a successful um, night in that they've retained all their um, MPs. They don't actually sit. They don't actually sit in Westminster. But these build on local council elections where they've also done very well. And Lou MacDonald said it's time to prepare for a new future together. And listen to this on this island. Mm. And Sinn Féin, obviously the nationalist um, pro-unification party in Northern Ireland. It's just, worth, it's just something they're worth watching for us. I spoke to Arlene Foster, the former leader of the DUP last night, and she was making the point that reform have got a little bit of a leg up in Northern Ireland because there's one candidate there who represents, I believe, the TUV, a unionist party that is affiliated with reform. So in a way, reform could count another seat, almost mm. by association. Yeah, DUP didn't have a great day. I think they lost two seats uh, as well. But Camilla, very keen to get your take on the future of the Conservatives. As we've said, obviously, they've had a terrible, you know, a terrible 24 hours. You know, this is a this is a defeat which is actually a record defeat for the Conservatives and their 190 year history. You know, let's make no bones about it. It has been a disaster. But some of the leadership, uh, possible leadership contenders are going to be a big debate now about what next for the Conservatives. I've highlighted, and you may have others, I've highlighted the people who squeaked through, so mm -hmm. to speak, were Jeremy Hunt, former Chancellor, who we thought may lose his seat, Kemi Badenoch, um, Swella Bravham and Priti Patel and Tom Tugendhat. I agree with all those. When you look at those, left what else what did you think? Robert Jenrick. Right. who has squeaked through as well, and mm. I think he'll definitely launch a leadership bid. I mean, the most brazen of all of them last night was Suella Braverman. She was up on stage giving her sort of conciliatory speech, I think looking like she was absolutely 100% on manoeuvres. Uh, Pretty Patel again sort of was talking about the future direction of the party. There was a report last week, Kamal, that she can't be Tory leader because she's too short at five foot tall. Make of that what you will. Tom Tugendhat, certainly he will run. Serves Earl Grey as a default tea, which I don't know if I agree with. Yeah, well, you can get him on the daily tea at least. I think, I think yeah, we probably we have will have discussion. to. Now, Jeremy Hunt, that does worry me quite greatly because he's only just sneaked in in Godalming and Ash, managed to fend off the yellows there. He's tried to be leader before. He failed quite badly. I think we can both agree, nice bloke, bad politician. I wonder, Camilla, whether he might be on the ticket in the same way that Liz Truss, as she sank, desperately clutched at the straw that was uh, Jeremy Hunt to be Chancellor. And of course, it didn't save her in the end. He seems like the person who at least some of the Conservative tribe might quite like as quite a powerful something, but certainly not the leader of the opposition. That is the absolutely wrong direction to go in. The person that's been lying low, but I think has the greatest chance of leading the party, is Kemi Badenoch. So she's done well in Saffron Walden, and they'll be regrouping as we speak. You know, WhatsApp groups will be being set up to make sure that people are in the right camp to back different candidates. Obviously, the complexion of the Conservative Party has changed somewhat, and it's sort of the chips need to fall and see who's gone from the One Nationers, who's left from the more right wing Brexity side of things. I mean, quite a lot of One Nationers have gone. Quite a lot of people, ironically, that were ready for Rishi. I'm thinking about people like Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary, Victoria Prentice, the Attorney General, uh, Alex Chalk, very good friends with Rishi Sunak. You know, they've all gone. And ironically, Kamal, and this I know is causing a bit of a stir because quite a few Conservatives were complaining about it last night to me. Who remains? Well, Rishi Sunak, he keeps his seat. Jeremy Hunt, he keeps his. Oliver Dowden, he keeps his seat as well. Isn't that wonderful for them all? And of course, the Conservatives that have gone feel a little bit resentful that the architects of this complete and utter annihilation of the Tory party quite happily go into four more years, which I think is pretty tricky. It wasn't the complete wipeout, which I think makes the the next couple of years for the Conservatives much more interesting to watch. If they had really been destroyed down to a rump, the public would just sort of move on and just yeah. be thinking, why should we listen? So I think William Hay got it about right, obviously the former leader of the Conservative Party. He said, we are at least viable as an opposition, i.e. there are enough of them. You know, they've got more than a mini minivan full, which I think is quite useful. 
And there is some there are some areas of weak underbelly underbelly for the Labour Party. That is the very low uh, vote share. Uh, yes. that Labour achieved, 34%. We spoke about this. We, we did. said this could be a problem and if it's turnout, below 40. Yeah, below 40 was always going to be an issue, particularly if they got a huge majority, which is what they've got. And then the second point I think is worth us keeping an eye on is that the turnout for the whole election was only 60%, and that is the second lowest in a UK election since 1885. The, uh, the last time we were that far... Um, down in turnout was 2001 and that was obviously the year that Blair was very very obviously going to win the election which is what affected the turnout in that on that situation there's a lot of apathy out there and that means that although Labour have won big they don't feel like the Blairite juggernaut and therefore the interest in what the Conservatives do next I think is higher than it could have been. Well look nearly two-thirds of the public voted for someone else or didn't bother voting at all. Secondly, a million more people voted for the Conservatives and reform than Keir Starmer. Thirdly, many more people voted for Jeremy Corbyn than have for Keir Starmer, which is interesting. Before we speak to Ian Duncan Smith, can we just discuss Liz Truss? Please, My let, God. let me discuss, let us discuss Liz Truss. It, it will be, her, her whole journey in politics is full of moments, whether that's talking about cheese at a uh, party conference, whether it's uh, resigning more quickly than a lettuce could go off in a fridge uh, as prime minister, whatever it is she's been involved in. And she, frankly, has surpassed herself, I think, over the last 12 hours. Shall we just listen to the reaction in the Telegraph newsroom? This happened at about 7am and it was that moment where we had to wait for her to arrive at her count in South West Norfolk and kept all the other candidates waiting. Very rude. And then this happened. Trust Liz, the Conservative Party candidate, 11,200. Oh. oh my God. Oh my God. There's your Portillo moment, everyone. That We've is got the... it finally. That is the Telegraph newsroom and you, Camilla, with everyone. We're all standing there watching Liz Truss lose her seat despite a huge uh, majority. Now, of course, in this situation, Camilla, you are supposed to be gracious. You are supposed to go onto the podium, give a speech, congratulating the person who has won your seat. What did Liz Truss do? She just walked off. I mean, she didn't say anything to anyone. Wouldn't you thank your activists, your members, your supporters? So bizarre. So she walked off the podium in a slightly awkward manner, but there was, there was Ross Atkins from the BBC sort of standing there, and I think he literally poked a microphone under her mouth and said, you know, what have you got to say? And here's what happened. But do you accept that first as a cabinet minister and then for a brief time as prime minister, you were part of the people in power who were overseeing those things not being delivered? I agree I was part of that. That's absolutely true. But during our 14 years in power, unfortunately, we did not do enough to take on the, the legacy we'd been left, in particular things like the Human Rights Act that made it very difficult for us to deport illegal immigrants and that is one of the reasons I think we've ended up in the situation we are now. Well, she once boasted of being the only Conservative in the room. She's the only Conservative in a room alone now because she's no longer in Parliament. Farewell for the moment from Liz Truss. But who had a much more <laughs> successful day? We can see him Liz now. Liz Truss, he's in the studio. He's, he's walking in now. absolutely delighted. Ian Duncan Smith, do come into the studio. <clears throat> Sir Ian Duncan Smith also known as IDS, former Conservative leader and the newly elected Tory MP for Chingford and Woodford Green, joins us in the Daily Tea studio. Be honest, Ian, did you think you were going to win? Because it was so tight. You had a 1,225 majority? Originally, yes. Yeah. Well, actually, I always believed uh, I had a chance of winning for two good reasons. I have worked that seat so hard and done so much locally. I... I knew from the reactions that this wasn't uh, one of those kind of great crashing changes 
what it was going to be was a fight on the margins uh, very much uh, between myself and Labour. It was always clear from the start. Reform being in my constituency didn't help. They took some votes off me, but I think they took some votes off Labour too. So it was more a case of I knew I had a straight fight with them and I, I knew where our vote lay and, uh, and they knew where theirs lay. So it became a very tight fight and from the beginning. What I had the greatest moment, I have to tell you, if there is a moment, <coughs> was to go on the BBC after my uh, victory and to be assailed uh, to say that oh, it was all down to split and uh, isn't that what you've been lucky and, and I said um, actually I seem to recall the the exit poll had me a one percent chance of winning the seat so if I do think I had two victories one was winning in the seat which I'm very pleased of and proud of my constituents but secondly was to uh, how can we say it Stick it to the exit poll. Very <laughs> I mean, talking about that split, that was because Pfizer Shaheen, <clears throat> who had been standing as the Labour candidate, was then suspended by the party. She then ran as an independent against a new Labour candidate. So to be fair, that vote on the left was divided, Ian, which may have helped push you through. It, it was, but also I have to tell you uh, that... When a party opposite you is split, it sometimes has uh, negative reactions in your own setup because lots of uh, people we found in the last two weeks, and we couldn't get to everybody, were assuming that you were in. They said, some of them said, oh, you're fine, you don't need my vote. Lots of them. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, we can't get to all of that. That's the first point about it. The second point about it is actually that quite a lot of people felt sorry for her and what the way that she was treated and some Conservatives then went to support her on the basis that it wouldn't change anything with me. It's astonishing how people start second-guessing a result and then make their minds up. So it's not quite as simple as that, because we, we knew every vote and where it was, and we ha found out where they were going. So, so um, we just had to keep playing straight all the time, believing that if it had been a one Labour candidate, I still think it would have been an incredibly tight fight for us. That's what we believed, and I think that's what would have happened. But I'm not going to say anything. It wasn't me that won it. It was my constituents that won it for me by staying true to me. And I'm I'm very pleased about that. Now, so Ian, you've seen a few <clears> ups <throat> and downs in your political career. You've seen big losses and big moments of victory. Put this uh, last 24 <clears throat> hours in context. Huge Labour majority. The worst Conservative performance in terms of seats won in your modern history. How are you feeling now? <clears throat> Well, I'm deeply saddened about the implosion uh, of the Conservatives, not just during the election, but over the last period. So two reflections, I suppose. One, this is not 97. And I've been saying that right the way. In fact, when I was here on the podcast, said I said, this does not I feel remember. like 97. Mm. And it didn't. And what I couldn't get my head around was we found no Conservatives that wanted and would claim wanted A, a Labour government, or B, wanted to have Keir Starmer. That was peculiar. In 97, it was a slam dunk. I was getting doors shut on me by Conservatives saying they were voting Labour. They wanted Blair. And you can see that in the result, because what you've got here is a poll that tells you this is a very tiny proportion of the electorate to have voted for this big Grand Slam victory, when you look at Blair's, it was higher, over well over 40%. And even in 2019, ours, we won, the 80-seat majority, was well over 40%. So what does that teach us? And I think it teaches us something very important. It was governed by a real anger about us and our behavior, and perhaps to come back on that one. And secondly, it was a bit of a plague on all your houses of the existing political elite, because so much was about reform and the protests that went to reform to say we're really tired of this now and you make promises you don't always deliver and we don't actually really necessarily believe that Labour will be any different. So reform, I don't know, I was told cost maybe the Conservatives 100 seats in the end with the voting etc. So you can see the story really following that for the Conservatives is what happened? Why did they all go to reform so many of our vote? Now, a lot of Labour vote went to reform, too. We do tend to forget that. So there was a protest in the reform vote, which should get all politicians here in the UK to sit up. And the second bit of that, the turnout was terrible. Yes. It was really shocking. And I saw you mentioned that earlier. But the fact is, those two things together are that the story is, why has the public switched off from mainstream politics, from mainstream politicians, and why are they so angry? First and foremost, with my, my party in government, and boy, didn't we give them every reason to be so, 
But also there was a real, not a great sense that we were desperate for Labour, which you would have expected after 14 years. And Blair certainly mined that very much. But this was not like that. So there's a lot to think about here before we go knee-jerk on everything and decide we know what the result was. I can tell you to my party, I think a better time to shut up for the moment and try and figure out what actually happened and then how you respond to it. Shut up and reflect before perhaps launching into a leadership race, although, of course, we'll ask you in just a moment who you think might be best to reunite the right. Before we do that, William Haig, your old friend, has suggested that it might be difficult for the Conservatives to form an effective opposition because they don't necessarily have enough people, 121 seats, to have enough shadow ministers to match Labour. Is that going to be a problem? No, I don't agree with them at all. Um, I think it's wholly possible for us to form an opposition. That is our duty under the Constitution. So um, I do get tired of people coming up with all sorts of peculiar ideas. You don't have to have everybody matched across the the dispatch box. Most of the uh, non-shadow secretaries of state grind away and do work, but they don't get much limelight and they mm. hardly ever get a chance to speak at the dispatch box. So you can reduce the numbers quite dramatically. It's not like governing. It's about opposing and opposing needs you to be light on your feet, not heavy in job titles. Job titles don't mean anything in opposition, really. It's about what you do and how you pick your targets. Are you even going to be listened to in opposition? I mean, you've been there, done it and got the T-shirt. It's pretty miserable, isn't it? Well, I'm sitting here as an elected MP and I was sitting around in 97 when we hit the buffers, big time. Uh, only the difference was, as I said, it was a very definitive vote for Blair and for the change that he proposed. Uh, this time it's a more complex message. Uh, and I, only, I, I, do, I really do say to my party, um, one of the things that really upset everybody, yeah, there are all these problems. We were hit by the biggest shock, two economic shocks as a result of what happened uh, over the COVID and also over the invasion of Ukraine. Any government gets buffeted by that, the public will turn eventually and say, we're fed up with you. I can see that. But it's also the way we behave during that period. I, am, I got really sick and tired with so many of these cabinet ministers posturing, doing interviews, making statements. I mean, just endlessly promoting themselves. And you know a party is on the skids when all a cabinet minister can do is to go out and talk about themselves. And that really upset the public. You know, no contrition, no sense that there were things that we could have done better, no sense that we took to squabbling or really didn't do our job properly uh, during the COVID thing and lockdown too often. No sense of looking back and saying, do you know what, we could have done this better. Maybe we should have tried harder. Maybe we should have remembered the incredible uh, uh, gift that they give you to go into government and how you need to react. And also, finally, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to say this because some of my colleagues will probably be upset about it. But in all of that, far too many people took their constituencies for granted. Now, there are very many on low majorities, like myself, sadly like Theresa Villiers, who worked away at their seats. You have to. But there were lots of so-called safe seats that literally people didn't do any work in until the last moment when suddenly worrying about their seats. And the truth is, the public has a habit of giving you a kicking when they think you forget them politically and forget them personally. And I have to say there's a combination of a bit of that. When you get complacent, when you don't listen to them, when you just treat them as though they're going to line up the next time and vote for you, there is all my experience of times in Parliament. That's when they decide, you know what, I don't have to do this, so I'm going to give you a kicking. They may not know how to do it, but they certainly do it pretty effectively, and we had one of those and yesterday. Serene, Serene what, is, so <clears throat> what do you think should happen next for the Conservatives? How, how should they think about the next two to three months or the next six months? And, of course, you are going to need a leader. You're going to need someone to, as you say, Camilla, unite the factions, stop any squabbling into the future. Give us your blueprint for... You know, the Conservatives. Well, the first thing is I think we have to take a deep breath. There's already people going out saying we've got to do this and we've got to do that. And my answer is you don't have a clue. Honestly, having sat through three terms of opposition is debilitating. I mean, I was leader during that. And I used to say that the problem with uh, my party was that... Uh, you know, it wasn't that it had an argument, it could find an argument in an empty room. It was that, sadly, the empty room kept on winning every time. <laughs> so we argued amongst ourselves endlessly for about eight years until finally somebody woke up one day and said, you know what, wouldn't be a bad idea if we actually tried to get into government where the arguments matter. Uh, that's the first thing. So you just need to pause for a second and think very carefully 
And then we need to look at what happened with Starmer's vote. And this is the key. Different from Blair's time, Starmer's lower level of vote does give us an opportunity to be a proper opposition and to start picking our targets. He is going to face all sorts of demands from the left of his party, and there'll be divisions in there very early on, which Blair didn't face straight away because he had a very strong control over his party. And with that lower amount of votes that they got, it's important to remember, as you pointed out earlier on, that the majority didn't vote for them at all. And that is the area where we need to look at why and how do you represent their interests with a government that didn't get elected by them at all. And I think this takes time. So we need to pause and understand what did they say to us and not lecture them about what they thought they said to us and then figure out how we mount opposition. If we do that carefully enough, I just don't think this government that's been elected will last like Blair's. I think we can reduce its timescale, but it has to be clever. Although there is one factor that wasn't apparent in 97 or 2001 or 2005, and that's Nigel Farage and reform. How do you handle them? Well, I think we need to understand and we need to do some work on exactly why they really voted the way they did. I think hugely it was in despair at us. It was in despair of the way we were behaving. And it was in despair over the fact that we had made promises to them, which it's not just that we didn't deliver them. They're not stupid. They know sometimes things are tough to deliver. But it was the, the whole uh, process of the game of the rowing about who was the failure, how did we not do this, who is to blame. Blaming people in advance of an election defeat strikes me uh, to be utterly self-centred and selfish. Are you talking, selfish. Serena, about Suella Braverman, basically? Can I put that to you? That every, well, every comment that you make, I think to myself, hmm, maybe Suella Braverman is... Well, there were, uh, yeah, there were lots of others. All the cabinet ministers need to sort of... Uh, take a good long look in the mirror and say, did we really help this defeat or did we hinder it? And I think sometimes so much was the disagreement around the cabinet table that you have to say that uh, that element alone made this look like a rabble. Uh, and as you enter an election looking a bit like a rabble, then the public will never really choose you. They want to have at least a clean idea of who you are and where you're going. Anyway, apologies. You, you were saying about Nigel Farage. Sorry, <coughs> you no, asked no, about no. that. No, no, no. Go for it. Gone. So I think Sorry, the key yes. thing here is I honestly think that we just need to, instead of um, arrogantly saying, we know what this is all about, we don't really, because there are really lots of reasons, quite different reasons, why people went and voted for Farage. Lots of them that went to reform didn't necessarily, I think, have any love for Farage or for some of the others that were in the party. But they were looking for a place to go to say to, actually, by the way, to Labour as well, <laughs> they need to think about this, uh, a plague on both your houses. We have had enough of this idea that our selection is only amongst the two of you. And what we're going to say to you now is that something needs to change here big time and you need to start listening to what we're worried about. And it's true, migration is a very critical touch point on this. You know, for too long, and this is, I've had this argument uh, again with the left on this uh, enormously, if we go on believing that those who worry about migration are somehow bigots and somehow don't represent mainstream views, then we will go on making the mistake of misunderstanding what they are. Most of them are decent people who work hard, get on with their lives, try and plan for their futures, look after their kids and their grandchildren. Their aspirations are to do better for the most part. All of that is there, but at the same time, they worry. They worry about the nature of the, the, the jobs and the salaries that go down sometimes when you have very large scales of migration uncontrolled. They worry, too, about the nature of how bogged down we get with government trying to solve this problem. And they wonder why it is that having left the European Union, we can't get this under control. And somehow we fail to explain or even try and figure that out in the early days. And we paid the penalty in the latter days of the government for that. Um, People blamed Rishi Sunak on that. But the truth is, the grounds for that were set almost the day after we won the 2019 election because we didn't take this bit seriously enough. So it, it's about controlled migration, not no migration, and making sure that people understand how that works in their interests rather than looking like it was something that's going to swamp and dom dominate them. Ian, what role do you want to play in the reforming of the Conservative Party? Because... You speak a lot of sense. I was just thinking as you were speaking, could you have a Cincinnatus moment 
and come back as a so-called grey hair to try and patch things back together? Has that crossed your mind? Uh, no, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> First of all, I'm, no, get I'm off too the tired. <laughs> I'm too tired to uh, even think about that. But the honest truth is that I did it once. I know what it's like. It's the toughest job in politics to be leader of the opposition. It's a thankless task. Everybody else knows what you should be doing. Everybody else goes out and talks behind your back. Their own ambitions uh, run them always ahead of the game. And uh, sometimes you get lucky because you happen to be there when finally your party wakes up and says, you know what, we ought to get back into government. But until they do that, uh, there's a problem. And I, I was just, somebody said to me, you know, the trouble was you were washing your dirty linen in public and that also doesn't help. And I said, well, truth was, I don't think it was so much that we were washing our dirty linen in public. It's that we spent our time putting it back on again and wearing it in public. <laughs> That's what really worried me. Now, Serene, Serene <clears throat> okay, maybe not you then, but I, I just want to just be clear after, after Kabila's question. Is Nigel Farage part of that conversation? Are you on the Braverman side of the debate, which is we need Farage in that conversation about the future of the right as Conservatives? Or are you more in the Kemi Bedenok position, which is the Conservatives need to have that conversation without Nigel Farage? Do not go there. I'm on neither, because I think that's a bit arrogant for us to decide on either end what exactly this problem is. And I said earlier on, we need to sit carefully and understand why did people not politicians, go to reform in such large numbers that cost the Conservative Party dear and actually stripped out a very significant potential majority in terms of proportion from Keir Starmer. It's a thing of both parties. So for our party, instead of us saying, I know why they went there and therefore we have to talk to Farage immediately or I know why they went there and we don't need to talk to him because we can put this right. I think we need to be a, show a little more humility and humility is very important. Opposition doesn't get listened to. Who the hell wants to listen to us right now, really? Because we just lost and got a punishment beating uh, last night. So who's going to say, oh, no, no, I have to listen to the Tory party now when they comment. They don't want to listen to us. Opposition's number one rule, earn the right to be heard. That is tough. Earn the right to be heard. How do you do that? By reflecting on what was in their minds when they went and voted the other way, rather than what was in your minds. And that's a tough one, because politicians are by and large almost certain they always know the answer to everything <laughs> until <laughs> they have to apply it. Yeah, quite. Well, exactly right. It's like the comment pages of any particular newspaper. <laughs> you all know what the answer is, but none of you have to go and fight to actually get it done. So a politician needs to take his pace back in my party and say, no, no, it's very important that we try and understand now why they did that and what would it take for them to look again at a Conservative Party, rather than saying, I know the solution, we're going to grab hold of him, he's going to come in. Did, did he bring them all in, or did they go to him for a different reason? What must Rishi Sunak <clears throat> do now? Sir Ian, he's the only PM of the last 14 years to hold on to his seat. Should he stick around? Should he be part of this debate for you? I think he's earned the right to be part of that. I... You know, I didn't always agree with everything that was going on. But the one thing I do think is now if the one thing that he can give, which, by the way, I was very critical of um, one of his predecessors uh, after the Brexit vote, David Cameron, who came to the steps of Downing Street and walked off. Mm. I thought he had a responsibility, having called the vote <clears throat> to help the party get through what happens next and give us some time to make a proper decision. Uh, and I think the same to some degree here. I know some of my colleagues are going to go, oh, you know, we've got to get it done now. We, uh, we know what we want. I think that point that I made earlier about just reflecting for a second in a very unarrogant way about why they went to reform rather than we see Farage as the solution, my answer is you need to understand what made them. And there'll be lots of different motivational positions on this, but I think it's important. And I therefore, you need a, just a little bit of breathing space on this. I, that's not going to be popular with a number of my colleagues, but I frankly couldn't give a damn. Uh, my position these days <laughs> doesn't rely on them wanting me or not wanting me. But I have to tell you that that is what I would want. I would want just his gift to the Conservative Party after having gone into the worst defeat, just to give us a breathing space for us to be able to figure that out before we leap uh, and quite often leap into the unknown. So you're saying you want him to remain as as, as opposition leader for as long as possible while well, you sort of... I, I don't know what the timing does that mean, but I just mean that I've heard people saying we've got to get this out of the way and done in two or three weeks. And I think that would be a mistake. After all, we've got the summer break as well to think about. And I think we need to do some of that. And I think 
we and I, by the way, I don't agree with those who say we can't go back to our electorate, to to our membership, because I think, frankly, you saw what happened when we didn't do that, and, and that means that they don't feel locked in. So we have to do that, but at the same time, we have to kind of mount and an, uh, or try and get an understanding so that we can mount a proper discussion and debate, so that what we pick, rather than who we pick, becomes the driving force, and the who then becomes the cherry on the cake. So, Ian, we could <coughs> speak to you for hours, but sadly, I don't think any of us have had much sleep or any sleep over the last 36 hours at least. So thank you so much for joining us as that rare thing, a successful Conservative candidate <laughs> who is now a conser- still a Conservative MP, Camilla. Thank you so much, Sir Ian. And I would imagine you'd like to take a lie down. How many miles do you think you covered over the course of the last five to six weeks? I can't be exact, but I think I walked personally, as my left knee will tell you, uh, something between 450 to 500 miles. We, uh, we, somebody was having one of those sort of, I don't know, the, I've got a, an analogue watch, so I don't know except the time. But they were doing, oh, that's uh, 20,000 steps today. But we were out from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8, 9 o'clock at night. So. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Ian. Good. Well, that's us done. I was going to say for another day, but I should say another day's couple of days we've been non-stop Kamal what are you going to do tonight what's the first thing you're going to do when you get home I have some friends who are coming to stay from oh, France no, so you I'm haven't. going to have to go back and uh, and revim myself to be nice and Va-va-voom. wonderful yes, you nice will and need with your French dinner. friends uh, lovely dinner guests so I'm off to dinner tonight but yes we'll have a little relaxation tomorrow and then back at it uh, on Sunday relaxation when write my, there's an England column. match on. I know there is an England <laughs> match will be very tense but look Camilla another election we've made it through we the have two to. of us uh, together uh, another momentous day elections are all always amazing things and we mustn't forget that many many countries don't have uh, the privileges that we have around uh, uh, a day of an election and there's going to be a huge amount to talk about what Serene has been saying about the future of the Conservatives but at this time for voters what is this new government actually going to do? We'll be back on Monday at 5pm. <laughs>